her own when you said, and what happens between the worlds stays in the world. <laughs> <laughs> what happens between the worlds stays between the worlds. <laughs> oh, well. Thank you. Thank you. It's like Thank Vegas. You. It's it's a lot like Vegas between the worlds. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for for coming. Thank you for validating our choice to get together and do this. Um, uh, I think you know all of us, but we'll just go through it again for the sake of the recording. I'm Maria. I do a daily astro blog on cosmic reflections and uh, radical astrology pages. Um, River Culver is River of Stars, is his astro business. He's astrologer. Astrology. River of Stars Astrology. River of Stars Astrology. Yeah, we will we'll give shameless plugs in the chat for our, our websites and businesses, I promise. Uh, <laughs> uh, Verone Bright, Verone Oracle is your business, um, astrologer and oracle extraordinaire, Julie Sherwood, astrologer and wellness, health and wellness coach, your best hopes wellness, and Michael Hartigan, also known as Uma Stellar, and um, One Sky Astrology. I think I got them all. So this is- Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello, hello. hello. Thanks for being here. Thank you for coming. Yes, yes. And so, I'm going to jump in real quick just to say for people, um, I posted the Zoom link on the Facebook page. So if any of you all are friends with people on the Facebook page saying, where is it? Where is it? Then just let them know, come to the, the Zoom link. So. Yay. Good. All right, so we are here to talk about the unique astrology of the United States from now till points in 2029. And um, since we're starting now, we should probably talk about now because now is an, a pretty interesting day um, in the stars. It's the full moon in Aquarius conjunct Saturn, conjunct FOMO house. <laughs> so there's- Maria. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just, for anyone listening who isn't aware, we all practice a form of sidereal astrology. Um, so this is going to be different than the more mainstream tropical astrology in the West. This is astrology configured to the stars. And in particular, we use the sizes of the actual constellations to measure the zodiac. So sorry to interrupt. No, that's, that's a great kind of. ad. Yeah, it's kind of important. Yeah. Um, we It's called either true sidereal astrology or true constellational astrology, 13 sign astrology. There are some names for it, but the most important part to remember is that true means true to the sky. You could look at a chart and it will match what you see if you look up, right? That's the goal. And the other goal is to not necessarily make the constellations all equal size because they're not in the sky. Certain constellations are smaller, certain constellations are bigger. And so that is the type of astrology that we use, 13 sign, because we also count the sign of Ophiuchus because it does meet the criteria of crossing the ecliptic. So is, that a, is that a good enough brief discussion? I, I would go a little further because we're talking about transits and, and, and the way that sidereal astrologists deal with transits is to account for processions. So we'll be talking about here. I, I just briefly uh, share my screen and we'll be talking about the Pluto return is happening in 2024. So that's a little different even than tropical and mainstream. So it affects transits too, because these transits are adjusted for procession and the transits are accounted for sidereally as well. So yeah, I think that's important. Thank you, River. Yeah, and I'm going to throw another little um, tidbit in there too. And and um, Bria and I have talked a bit about this is 
there, there is some discussion about where do we measure the edges of each constellation without beating, you know, something down to the ground right now. One of the ways I've come to reconcile myself to the idea that there are different ways we measure this. What we're trying to do is put a human language and a construction around something that is naturally in the sky in a way we can have a conversation about it, have some sort of point of relativity. So that creates a little bit of um, ongoing discussion amongst those of us who do this work about where the boundary of this is, where the boundary of that is. And, and it's totally understandable that people are gonna have different points of view and approaches because of however you measure that, we're trying to measure something that's an energetic statement in the sky, if you will. That's how I see it. So I just want to put that out there too, because I know that's come up in conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying oh, to essentially, today. yeah, trying to essentially put something that is three D into a two D uh -huh. paper that you can read. So, so right. there will be differences when we go with that. But um, the most important thing to remember is that it's not tropical, and you probably figured that out when I said full moon in Aquarius. Because tropical has it in Pisces, mm -hmm. right? Sense. So yeah, oh. um, no. but and and it's literally as far as you look in the sky. If you look at the stars of Aquarius, that is where the moon is. Yeah, yeah, it is literally in the constellation of Aquarius. So yeah. Right. In fact, why don't I share that screen? Why don't I go ahead and just share? the chart for today's as we speak almost full moon can everybody see that it's starting to populate okay there you go bingo and here we are so this is essentially what our chart looks like that most of us now again not all five of us have a chart that looks exactly like this but essentially, this is what we have. I use different colors than some. So if you look to where the moon is on the left, moon is right next to Saturn. It conjoined Saturn. It perfected a conjunction this morning. Now it's moved a little bit beyond that, but not too far. So we can still say that this full moon is conjunct Saturn. Anybody want to chime in on what that means for us right now, guys? Mm, it's good for being serious. And uh, with Aquarius, it's good for insight, good for looking forward. So I think it's a pretty appropriately timed meeting. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I would add just the Saturn and Aquarius piece. We had, we had the new moon when Saturn had just entered Aquarius and we had a new moon in Aquarius and now we're on the opposite side of that with the full moon in Aquarius and just when Saturn moves into a sign our understanding the structure of our reality um, greatly shifts in in the case of Saturn and Aquarius there have been a lot of technological advancements and things that have become part of you know, the regular discourse from AI, um, that's a big one, but, mm -hmm. but to all, all kinds of things. And I, I think the technological piece and just like the shifting of our paradigm and shifting of our world with, with Saturn and Aquarius is really being illuminated at this full moon, this super moon, which is also very close to the earth. Um, so it's, it's very powerful in, in my opinion, just like the tides, you know, get really huge with like a super moon. I used to live right on the water of the ocean and the tides would just be huge. I mean, the tides in our body, um, as we're made of water, I feel, I feel moved I, yeah. <laughs> from this moon. Well, and that sun, you know, being in Leo, it, it's it's definitely illuminating for us. How are we going to look at the way we express ourselves in this new paradigm, if you will, this new AI structure, this new um, technological uh, platform? It, and, and you're seeing a lot of shifting in different social media aspects. And I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but the gist is 
you know, we had a rename of Twitter, we've had, you know, different constructs that have come up in the way people interact on social media. So, you know, and it's coming from a personal self-expression need, son Leo, to be seen out there in that world. And so I think this full moon is really going to emphasize that for us. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm definitely feeling... I'm definitely feeling like the the moon and and Saturn and maybe I can even echo back into the like technological AI piece is that for me, Aquarius has a lot to do with the fountain of life and these like life giving waters and even tapping us into the immortality piece of like this ever flowing fountain and Saturn has so much to do with limits and, and our mortality. So I've been in between this, like, I'm a mortal being, and I'm a limitless soul. And even to tie it back into like, the Saturn retrograde in in Aquarius with AI, I think there's this idea that we could live forever through technological advancements, or our consciousness could be uploaded onto some type of disk or drive. So I think um, there's both of this like organic and artificial ways to tap into maybe life and death that I was experiencing with this full moon Saturn um, Aquarius energy, which is like pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's interesting that, that this is the point from which we're sort of starting our discussion, right? And, and starting to measure, okay, 2024 is starting to get real right now. It, it, it all started this year when Pluto went square the nodes. So there's a couple of things about 2023 that's really setting up 2024 and beyond. And one, as you said, was Saturn entering Aquarius. That was, that was big. And I'm not sure that everybody caught how big that was, but it's, it's big. It's a big deal. The second is Pluto squaring the nodes. It's been that way for a while. It perfected in late July. And now they're they're separating a little bit, but it's still a pretty strong square. You know, we're still feeling it. And we'll go into exactly what that means on the ground a little bit later. But one, Saturn in Aquarius, two, Pluto square the nose. And and third is Eris has conjoined the North Nodes. That's happened right now. So those are three things that are like, welcome to 2024. Maria, and that's such a that's such a good point to make because I think because astrology is like charts and and graphs and screens and paper, I think we forget that like we're it's a living experience. It's to be experienced. We're experiencing it through our body, through our thoughts, through our interactions. And astrology isn't an isolated event. I'll probably say this every time I talk on one of these roundtables. It's not an isolated event. It's a continuation. Every transit is preparing you for the next transit, for the next transit. So these, like what Maria said, Saturn entering Aquarius, Pluto square the nodes, and Eris north node is giving us the knowledge, the information, the understanding for us to go into more transits that will have this kind of similar flavor. So yeah, here we go. It's getting real. (laughs) Yeah, I'd just like to tag on to that if I could. Uh, That I, I think as the moon entered Aquarius, so yesterday and through most of today, Uranus, the ruler, was... Uh, stationed, which has really amped up the anxiety and the electricity and the weirdness the, just yesterday and today. Uh, and uh, or or really, I actually I think it goes back a couple of days. And I, I wanted to give voice to that since we're starting where we are. And, you know, in our in our look at this, where we are is like really been one of the themes of all these transits in the next five years is turbulence. Like we're, yeah. we're like, this looks like some upcoming turbulence. And to today, I want to say it's, it's perfect to jump off from where we are right now because things are wonky. Yeah. 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 Well, then I would like, yeah. add one more quick, I'm going to add one more quick insight about the, the setup. And that is to not forget about, Pluto having just barely stuck an arm into Capricorn and then went, nope, going back into Sag. And I think that's pulled in some of the Capricornian flavor 
but yet this retrograde is giving us the opportunity to step back into the whole flavor of Sagittarius. What do we believe? What are our spiritual beliefs? What is the capital T truth? You know, and so forth. And I think that is also part of the setup that that you're referring to, Maria. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree, you guys. So let me stop sharing this screen so that we can move on to other stuff other stuff you yeah. know another interesting point is those of us who were born around this time i was born in 1963 this transiting saturn is opposite our natal uranus right now too so that's another interesting just little hmm interesting so there you have it all yeah. right shall we pull up the graphic that uh Michael. Yeah, I think the graphic would be good. Oh, yeah, yes. let's do, yeah. let's do. Uh, that's a good reference point. Yeah, I think that's a good jump off. So there we are. Is that us, the little yellow box? So, <laughs> the, that's, which, that's how I feel that. I feel like yeah, that. Already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, where we would be, we're in between Pluto's entering the orb of influence that happened earlier this year, concordant with it squaring the nodes. And then it doesn't even it doesn't even make its first exact contact, the Pl the Pluto return until uh, I want to say February. February. These are more approximate. I don't think we have to get very precise. I think looking at five years of time and maybe like an hour and a half, I'd love to stick to very broad strokes and maybe zoom in a little as it seems best. But yeah, this is what's going on. Who wants to kind of break this down like piece by piece? River does. River. <laughs> I maybe, do. <laughs> no, maybe just maybe just give a maybe just give a five words or less on the energies. Like Pluto, Pluto, what's the buzzwords? You know, progress new moon, what's that about? Would you like to talk about this? Um I'll throw you under the I, spotlight. I think Michael, you, I, I will chime in, but I feel like you 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 begin here with your graph and lay it out for us. Okay, okay, well, fair enough. I'll, I'll try to keep it to, to the pith. I think that Pluto, Pluto is governing processes that no one really likes to talk about. So it's going to be interesting to talk about that gracefully. Processes like death, rebirth, transformation, rejuvenation, which sort of implies that something had been cut off and then you regrow it the occult and all eighth house things, scorpionic, a few can things. So when a Pluto return happens, Pluto's moving back into the degree that it was in a, in a, in the natal chart of United States at this point. So Pluto energies will be at peak at, a, at an all time high. And that progressed. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I'm sorry. I just want to no, don't in. be, don't be please. That 1776 when we talk about the chart of the united states we're talking about the signing of the declaration of independence july 4th 1970 1776 um exactly and, and pluto takes 248 years to complete its orbit so pluto is coming back to that exact place where pluto was at the signing of the declaration of independence that's why it couldn't have been 2022 Right. <laughs> right. It's right. Because math. math. Right. Right. Because math. Because basic Cause math. subtraction. Thank right. you. Right. Somebody please. Thank you for acknowledging that. That's the one of the biggest things that has driven me crazy about this whole Pluto return discussion and other platforms. Mm. Just saying it. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But moving to the progress new moon, <laughs> I want to say without saying a lot about progressions, Progressed new moons always represent a new beginning, and the phase that will be in question is 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 about 30 years, about 29 and a half years long. So progressed new moons and Saturn cycles have the same amount of time, 29.5 years. So there's a lot of resonance there. And since the moon's close to Saturn, I thought I'd, I'd give that a little mention, but I don't want to get into progressed new moons. It's just not the time to have that conversation. Chiron is an asteroid slash comet. Uh, it's it's known as a centaur, half half asteroid, half comet, a sort of half man, half horse. 
it orbits between Saturn and Uranus, and it, it has to do with wounding and healing. It has to do with trauma and reclamation. And a Chiron return is just like the Pluto return and everything that River described about the point coming back to a point of origin and the energies being very high. A Chiron return is a time when we revisit uh, wounds when we heal, when things are up for review, and we can see them in the light of reclaiming ourselves. The, this becomes open to us. The Jupiter return is not going to be more than just one brief contact, but it will happen while the Chiron return is, is sort of making its forward and retrograde motion. Uh, a Jupiter return happens every 12 years. So this isn't nearly as significant. Now, Chiron is a 50, 50 year orbit. Jupiter returns to its point of origin every 12 years. And the cycles that it portends are cycles of success and hope and, uh, and optimism and growth and, and, and building general expanse for better or worse. And, and the last thing that we have on this chart is the Uranus return. And Uranus is sort of a weird cousin to Pluto in that he's unruly. He, he governs things that people don't like. So he governs change. And I want to distinguish really briefly when I said Pluto governs transformation. That's changing from one right. thing yeah, absolutely. It's very important. When we're talking about Pluto, we're talking about changing from one thing to a totally different thing. And when we talk about Uranus, we're talking about changing, but staying basically sort of the same. So a snake that sheds its skin is going through a Uranus process, but a tadpole that becomes a frog and gets to move on land then is that that's a Pluto process, a caterpillar to a, a butterfly or a moth is a Pluto a transformative process. So, um, and in, in the middle here, I just want to throw this into the mix early. We're not going to look at it very much, but in the middle here, we'll have, uh, we'll have Pluto trine to the United States Uranus. So, so we'll have in this interim, very, very, we'll be tuned into it, to a continuum, uh, a sort of thread through this process of change and transformation. Thank you. And I, I was just going to throw into that Jupiter return. The other thing about Jupiter is that expansion can be a pendulum swing too. So we have to really watch that it doesn't overemphasize or underemphasize this process with the Chiron return. <clears throat> and one of the things with Chiron too is we can become overly identified with the wound or the trauma or the pain that's being um, amplified. So I think mm -hmm. that Jupiter return in there even though it looks like just from the picture, because I can't remember the details, that it's, you know, sandwiched kind of between the return process of Chiron due to retrograde motion. So this could really exacerbate or over amplify, you know, the victim mentality, if you will. And I don't mean to be trite about that, but that's kind of the best way to explain it. Yeah, it could mm -hmm. also, I mean, from the over under perspective, it could also add the extra that you need to move beyond some of that. And I think that when we're, when we're pairing that with the Chiron return, it's the, I mean, the danger as Julie said, is that it gets a little, it, it swings a little too much to the poor me, I'm the victim, but Jupiter's energy can also be applied to the healing half of that. So there could be a real opportunity for, a healing. And since that's all still going on within the realm of the Pluto transformation, you know, mm -hmm, return, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm voting for kind of catalyzed by a new moon, right, which, which is a new beginning, even though it's progressed. I'm, I'm kind of voting for, you know, these stars are more hopeful than you'd think, you know, people hear Pluto return, ooh, Chiron return, ah, you put them all together, and there's a real opening for for a for like a, a deep karmic healing i think to 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 heal some things not just that have been bugging us for a few years that no we really might be able to get you know beyond things like slavery you know that that we really might be able to solve some major 
major problems that we've seen pop up. We've had to face it over these last few years, right? We've had that mirror That's held so up and we have had to face ourselves. But these planets, I don't know, signal an opportunity for a fairly profound healing. Yeah. I think that's a best case scenario. And I think you're right. I think a best case scenario would be to start a new a new cycle on a really kind of honest foot about the wounds we've caused and the wounds we've endured. That's yeah. a best case yeah. that'd be a best case scenario that as a nation we turn a foot we United States citizens and you know do that. Yeah. I, I think to invite Veroni to pop in here about um, Eris, because as we're talking about, you know, facing our say, how did Michael just put it? That was like, you, we've, we've had to look at what we've done and now we've got to sort of face the ramifications of, of ourselves to healing. And this might be a good time to talk about Eris. Well, I was going to say, and maybe I could segue into Eris too, is that I just want to bring into our awareness, each single one of us are in different places in ourselves, in our personal awareness and our collective awareness within our wounds, traumas, like we're all different. And so like a Pluto transformation and unearthing, I see Pluto is like, you're digging the soil, you are digging down deep, something that was buried. I mean, we literally, I'm gonna say this probably in everyone too, we're literally standing on the bones of the people that were stewards of this land after Europeans came over and committed mass genocide. That did not stop. We are not done with that. It's not over, it's still happening. To me, that's one of the biggest parts of the Pluto return here in the United States and the North Americas is that we have to realize like where this land came from. And to me, in order for all of us to be in the land of the free, we can't be standing on like the graves of the ones that we stole from. So that to me is a huge thing. Um, and every single one of us is in a different process. So, you know, what may be really blatant and loud to you or you or me may be like not even a faint whisper to somebody else. So it may have to get extremely loud and excruciating for all of us as a nation to have that Plutonian wake up and transformation to actually change states, as Michael was saying, going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Like we're all not going through the chrysalis at the same time. Like one of us may be a butterfly and the other one, we might be goo, you know, the other person could be goo. So really knowing that we're all doing it together, but at different stages um, and that the Chiron part is going to just, there's going to be such an emphasis on health and what health means to each one of us is going to be different. The way I do healing and medicine is going to be completely different than how maybe my neighbor does it. And, you know, Chiron back to the whole, um, Ophiuchus, as we practice the Ophiuchian astrology, Chiron was the teacher of Asclepius, Asclepius, like being seen possibly as Ophiuchus. So, you know, we are using that medicine of the serpent, the regeneration, rejuvenation, really finding those deeper parts in us, that strength that we have buried deep in us. When we think we don't have like one more fiber left in us to go on, we're going to have to remember that our ancient ancestors put that wisdom in our DNA so that we can go forward and actually make that deep change and transformation because we're going to have to go into the Uranus, Uranus return after this anyways. It's not done. So we got to, you know, we're going through it for a while. Like we don't have to be in fear, but we're going through it for a while. And yeah, Eris, because um, Eris and North Node is together until the end of November, I think. Um but Eris so, is also so the so the Chiron return will be conjunct Eris. Yeah, Chiron ret return will be conjunct Eris, and North right. Node and Eris are together. See, so preparing. You, yeah. I mean, Eris. I've experienced Eris. She can be pure rage, destruction, mm -hmm. chaos, strife, all of those things. I've definitely had some like outbursts, but also Eris. She holds the apple. She holds the golden apple of truth connected to the tree of life. So you know. I think that anger and rage, it's not always bad. Sometimes you have to be really pissed off when something bad is happening. So I see both. There's like anger and rage and fuel and deep ancient knowledge that's all going to be kind of like permeating at the same time. Well, look yeah. at where Chiron is doing his work. It's in Pisces. 
This is that yeah. recreating right, right. who he is and doing this healing work through that lens. And also uh, Chiron and Pisces can be an over connection to the pain and suffering of others to the point where we take it on ourselves. So that I think one of the keys is going to be really learning how to put that energetic bubble around ourselves, but keep it translucent so we see and connect with others, but we can't own it. Or it like you said, Verona, it's going to be a whole different approach to help. Yeah. Kim, the savior, savior syndrome is like not helping anybody because ultimately you can't do other people's healing. And if you try to, that, I mean, that's so big with generational healing where you're like, oh, I have to heal everyone in my family. No, you don't. You have to heal yourself. And then from that, it radiates out. Like if you try to take on the wounds of everybody in this, on this planet, you're, there's not gonna be anything left of you. Right. So, you know, you self, uh, self-preservation will be important. You'll have a lot more energy and compassion for others. If you're able to like focus on yourself and, and do those necessary healings that you do with you. And collectively, that's reflective on the comment before about, you know, did we cause our own wounds or are our wounds causing other wounds? You know, that, that <laughs> infinity, you know, concept. And again, that's Chiron Pisces. It's, it's, we have to stand on the outside and look in and we have to stand on the inside and look out and see how we can fine tune that in a way that we do heal the wounds, but don't take them on as who we are. Exactly. We can have... We can have individual healing and collective healing happening at the same time, but collective healing doesn't mean like I suck up everything around me. Right. That's not what collective healing is. No, no. Right. But and, but step one is always like with that Eris thing, step one is always recognizing that, that yeah, you caused this, right? That the chaos mm -hmm. and strife is entirely of your own making. And I that, would say I would say it a little differently if I could. I think you're on the right thing, but I think you can run the risk in in especially highly traumatized situations of sounding like you're victim blaming. So I would say yeah. I would just suggest just to pitch it back to you. It's what's in this for me? Like where's the lesson? Like oh bad things happen, but like where how did I yes, how am I complicit? How did I participate in this? But also uh like really the the thing I always see is where does this reveal something I had hidden from myself? It's a little That's more complicated. A thank you so much right. for letting me jump in. I'm so, thank you. Yeah. That no, I, that, that is a better way to put it, that, that personal responsibility is such a hard thing and such a touchy thing. Because yeah, you're yes. right. We don't want to victim blame. We don't want to victim blame ourselves. We don't want to victim blame other people. And we don't, we also don't want to you know, walk away from it and go, well, you know, that wasn't me. Okay. Right. Yeah. Maybe I didn't literally, you know, go back in time and shoot down native Americans, but I also have to accept that that is part of the legacy of oh, sure. where I am. Right. That, that, sure, that sure. is part of my history, whether I physically did it or not. And, and that is That's a hard, true. there's a lot of, there's a lot of elements of our history, American mm -hmm. history that we don't want to own. There's a lot of American history that I don't want to own. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, we might have not have done it, but our, a lot of our ancestors did. And we are the living, breathing present day ancestor. And Pluto mm -hmm. is power and power is taking on responsibility. You cannot be in your power and not take on like self-awareness and your own personal responsibility. Otherwise you're just letting somebody else take power from you. And so, you know, what are we doing as we move forward? Are we going to look at this and be real or are we going to be like, no, no, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. You know, if, if all of us do that, if everyone does that in all their bloodlines, like nothing changes and nothing heals. If no one wants to take responsibility, then like nothing changes. So we kind of all have to take responsibility together in order to change the present and the future. And this is right. our and, go round yeah. as a country where this return is happening. So this is our this is our first initiation into experiencing what Pluto return really means for us as a country. Mm -hmm. So that's I mean, it's, people I think sometimes forget 248 years is an awfully long time, but yet it's a small snapshot mm -hmm. of time historically. 
Mm -hmm. no. Sorry, Michael, I didn't mean to step over you, but I was just thinking about that. Oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. I am. That's a really great point. I, I was, I was wanting to say that the, that the, the, Oh, it's lost. Let's move on. It's okay. It truly <laughs> well, is. Uh, River, I'd River, I'd love you to talk about Indus since we've been yeah. talking about this. Can you jump in? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I've I've said this uh, in in other situations, but it's always bears repeating. And there are new people here. Um, when you look at the actual star alignments of Pluto and where as Pluto is returning upon itself from that seventeen seventy six date. Um, so Pluto is aligned right now to the alpha star of Indus, the Indian, which represents yeah. um, the Native American, also Asian, um, from Asia, the indigenous people of Asia. So of the, that's when this constellation was created. So Pluto right now, you know, aligned with Indus, um, we've just had a very horrific event happened in Maui that I think very much reflects um, some of this and this conversation about indigenous people and, um, and, and the founding of this country on their land. Um, also, Pluto is aligned and at the return will be aligned to Altair, which is the alpha star. Um, hold on, Pluto is aligned with Yes, Indus, Indus is the constellation and Alpha Indy is the alpha star of, it's a Southern hemisphere constellation, but if you draw a line from Pluto down, you'll get to the Indus constellation and Pluto is, is, is bringing in that energy from Indus in, in the natal chart and as Pluto returns upon itself. So those that subject matter, you know, a lot is coming to the surface um, in a in a profound way. Um, Robert, I didn't and mean to interrupt. Do do we have a sky shot of the Pluto return just so people can see or some sort of visual of you know, like where oh, yeah. is it? Yeah. We you know, I wish I had prepared that way. I don't have it readily available on my computer. If someone else does, then let's see. Well, and as you're pulling the, that up, uh, what are you looking for? The like, alignment to Indus, like Pluto's oh, with alignment, the, with the Pluto. like the sky, yeah. like the sky, sky view. Yeah, use this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me and, let me and, just get in with the natal chart, and we'll look at it from there because it it'll be it'll be the same, and we don't have to jump through any hoops. There Give you me go. One moment, please and keep it, talking. I so got let, I say, as you're pulling that up, I think one of the things. Um, and this could be interesting, especially with the newly discovered um, constellational effect here, is what happened historically with other countries or nations or cultures or whatever structural word you want to put around it that have already experienced their Pluto return. What can we as a country learn from those instances too? as I was thinking about the fact that this is our first time. So I don't know, just- Because we're a young country. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh. And- Oh yeah, there I, it is. That's a good image. Yeah, there's Indus, that star. Uh, you you right, can see right Indus down, below, yep. below the symbol of Pluto, that's Alpha Indus. And then if you actually go above Pluto, look above, um, above the ecliptic. So that's Indus is below. And then we have, yes, we have Aquila above with Altair, the alpha star of the eagle. This, the eagle is literally um, the symbol of the United States. Mm -hmm. And the symbol of freedom um, is a big concept that I do think is very present here at the Pluto return. Um, the eagle is also sacred to Native Americans. Um, but Pluto is bringing in above you have the eagle and below you have Indus. And so both of these uh, subjects, these are, are very present at this Pluto return. Hmm. 
And I know, Ron, you're you're our resident serpent expert. <laughs> me? Yes. So remind me again, because I can't keep it all in my little Mercurian head, um, about Medusa and where that might play into any of this return energy. I just had the image of the snake because a news event came up today about the don't tread on me flag. But what was really well, but what was really interesting is somebody made the the um connection to the fact that when Ben Franklin uh he wrote something and I forget all the details, but the gist was is he did in essence a cartoon meme that chopped this serpent into 13 pieces, replicating the 13 different colonies, and said, if you chop the snake into 13 pieces, it will die. But we have to be united to survive. So that image came to my mind as River was talking about some of these other images replication that replicate the, the spirit of the founding of this country. So I don't know how the serpent might play into that. And I know I'm putting you right on the spot, but. Oh, I don't care. I can be put on the spot. I, well, I mean, we're talking about 13 sign astrology. We're talking about a fucus. I think the serpent is just such a huge part of this type of astrological practice. Um, with Chiron, especially the Chiron return, Chiron using Chiron being the teacher of Asclepius, Asclepius using Medusa's blood as medicine, like the poison that heals is the poison that kills. So I think that, you know, the power of the serpent, the medicine of the serpent for me is regeneration, rejuvenation, shedding off parasites, um, you know, really being able to tap into deeper knowledge, the Kundalini, even the breath. I think that serpent energy even goes into like breath work and that back to the different type of medicine, is it a different type of medicine or is it the medicine that always once was that we have forgotten? You know, I think when we're talking about serpentine energy, whether it's the Ouroboros eating its tail or like the infinity, the eight, is it old or is it new? Is it futuristic or is it ancient? Is this something that we're learning or is it something that we're remembering? And all of that, I think, is going to be coming um, forward with the Pluto return, Chiron return, Jupiter return into the Uranus return. Because, you know, as we're digging, you know, like we're archaeologists of the earth and of ourself, of the past wisdom, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if even like, some ancient like uh, statues or something surfaced during the Pluto return. Something for us to remember that like, maybe like we used to know a whole bunch. We, we think that knowledge is linear. We think in this linear time because we've been taught linear time. And I can assure you that linear time is like, I, I don't know, I'm not into linear time. And it's definitely not the only time, you know, it's not like we're just progressing on this straight line. Look at all of the things from the past. Look at these like, amazing um these amazing things that were created all these like carvings on the side of the mountains and these e extravagant temples things that we the pyramids like things that we can't even do now to tell to say that we didn't have the wisdom or we didn't have the medicine or we didn't have the knowledge is you know i think we're going to start realizing that we actually know a lot more than we've been told through the whole brainwashing of our like school system and when we're literally like put into the program really early in order i mean they're called programs for a reason you know and so as we're moving away from it as we're transforming i think we're transforming into a more true version of ourselves now if anyone's gone through a deep pluto transit you're going to know shit's not fun you know sometimes it can feel really really intense but also you know would you rather stay like naive to yourself would you rather sleep on yourself or would you rather go through, through something a bit intense to remember your true power that comes from deep in your soul and I really think you know we're going to get tested like Michael said sometimes you're tested to remember yourself so yeah I think uh you know Medusa is not for everyone but I do like the serpent medicine for the fact of just being able to regenerate yourself well, and there's there's that inherent in a return, isn't there too? The the coming back around and the chance to remember at that point what was forgotten and right, the it's to in yeah, a, yeah, that that, that yeah, it reflects these outer things reflect inner processes. Please, please go ahead. I thought maybe you were done. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just but but when we talk about returns that way and and there's this there's a serpentine shape in it too that they, like they mm -hmm. say human face isn't linear 
returns right, and right. it's not just a flat circle either there's no no sacred um, time is the spiral sacred yes. time the maya will tell yes. you this the, all the calendar keepers will tell you time is a spiral and it doesn't have beginnings and endings the way we are trained to think about it yeah it's very true but at the same time i think when i look at all this i think to myself that even though uh, you know, I, I, as a person, I may feel a lack of like, let's say white guilt around genocide, but, but it's, it's cultural. This is a reckoning that our nation will, will face. And I think in a sense, the, you know, the phrase comes to mind, we may be through with the past. But I think with a Chiron return, a Pluto return, and all of the power around that, I don't think that our past is through with us. And I think there's going to be a, a surfacing. Varun, you talked about surfacing of ancient statues. I think that inwardly, inwardly, we'll all be in a process reflecting that. Our, mm -hmm. our soul level stuff around uh privilege and oppression genocide and war and slavery and arms dealing and everything american for better or worse everything american our our our, our personal statues are going to become unearthed and it's 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 a chance to heal. It's a chance to rejuvenate. That's regardless of the turns that the world takes, right? What we do as a nation on a personal level, this reflects an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. To, to, to keep that spiral moving, to, to wrap up an old way and to take, to take a new direction. It could be very beautiful, right? Regardless of what happens to the world. Well, so, Chiron thanks. Pipe. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's really that Chiron and Pisces, that opportunity to connect and heal by connecting to the all that is and recognize we are all one in the Piscean perspective. That's um, all we have as a United States in Pisces is just Chiron. Like if you want to lean into something, it's got to be that healing. Yep, at, at, yep. At that level. And you know, the other remarkable thing on this graphic that I'm looking at is after we go through this whole process of pure metamorphosis and transformation that the Pluto return mm -hmm. brings us, then mm -hmm. we go through the healing process and is emphasized by Jupiter return. Look at that gap for us mm -hmm. to integrate all of that before we move into the Uranus return, which will be in Taurus. And it's going to ask us, are we really authentically who we are meant to be? And what do we value in that Taurus? Right. How do right, we experience right. that on the individual level? What is our basic need identifier in life now that we've gone through all of this? Are well, we yeah, I mean, yeah, almost more than that, Julie. It's like, how do we, okay, where do we start building? Look at, look, all of this, all of this transformative metamorphosis, um, karma, karma facing, karma clearing, all of that stuff between now and the end of 25, beginning of 2026. And, and then we have the pause, like, okay, and now pause. what yeah the pause, pause right the pause. and now <laughs> the pause. In, in, <laughs> when it when life just slows Taurus. down yes. so that we can all integrate and yeah. we we all just yeah coast and then the yes exactly and then right, we right. you're in a situation but now what do we want to build right what do we want to what do we want to start <laughs> recreating from well that? uranus 11th house aquarius community the collective humanity you like you said maria we're building this for much more than just us as an individual but we have to go to our personal values in taurus to understand what that looks like for the community as a whole yes right. yeah. and this is a very big this is a very big return for the united states yeah. because uranus is <laughs> angular and the prior returns have really hit the country very very hard like if you take it back 84 years, you find yourself in 1944 and the exactitude of the return was almost to D-Day to the day. 
And if you take that back another 84 years, you get the Civil War. And I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but I want to say that Uranus is a little bit of like Uranus doesn't really care about who has to die for its ideals. Uranus is an idealist and a radical in its purest form. And when you have a Uranus return, that energy is going to be at peak. So I'm not saying um, that I see war or that I think this is the, you know, the, the, the one. I know a lot of people are waiting. They're holding their breath for World War III. And I'm, I'm not part of that breathless experiment, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if I saw it. What I think is that the polarization of Pluto is going to likely bring those questions to mind. Yes. And it bring those to the conversation. Who are we? And but I think it's going to be I don't think there's going to be one answer under the influence of a Pluto return. I think there's likely to be polarization. And I think we're likely to see conversation at best. It could be healing conversation with Chiron active. But the Uranus thing is going to is there's just such uh, Uranus is so unafraid to 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 throw matches in the forest it's it's it is i don't want to paint a rosy picture so we have that we have those two pieces and i wanted to be a debbie downer and offer the other one well it's important to know what this is you know to to get a heads up of what this is all going to feel like or likely to feel like because you know we're, we're talking about all high and mighty concepts here but that's great what's that going to feel like down in the dirt here. Yeah. And though, you know, I, I tend to be a little Pollyanna about these things and say that, okay, well, things are line, aligning to give us an opportunity for great healing. Yeah, that could also feel like every bone is being rebroken mm. so that it can set no. properly. You know, it may not feel swell. Yeah. Well, and at the same time, I think it's very important to give a best case scenario. Yeah. When you look at this, what's helpful to understand? Like it isn't that the that the you know, that the that maybe and especially in Taurus, especially with Uranus on Aldebaran, I think there could be great destabilization around these times to the US economy. But I think at the same time it's important to understand how can we use this inwardly because our inner evolutionary process reflects all this outer material like there's there's always the opportunity to do exactly what you're saying you know yeah. what i mean yeah. there's always the maria that to do exactly what you're saying and take i mean it doesn't it's not rose colored it's not pollyanna it's just on a spectrum that's a really good scenario you're thinking about things in a really good way you know, and another interesting note is which angle is that Uranus hanging out on? It's out on the descendant. <laughs> I mean, all about how we interact with other. And I would yeah. love, River, if you could jump in about the whole concept of Uranus on Aldebaran. What does oh, that mean? Yeah. Yes, River. If you don't mind. I'm, well, what comes to mind is I, I think that we are, like never before, I, um, presented with a hall of a hall of mirrors, a hall of uh, just there's so much that is that is false in my in my opinion. Um, and so much vying for our attention, integrity. Mm -hmm. Aldebaran, it, the word integrity is like so key. So so I feel like from from all sides, I, I feel like as a population we're yearning for truth for integrity for something that um mm -hmm. that we can really value in that way and so i feel like the uranus return will bringing be bringing forth that topic very strongly like what Cul culture integrity you know yeah 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 and, and i think to, to a nation right to the culture of a nation but yeah go ahead no, I was going to say, and I think it goes back to a drum I've been beating for a while, and, and Uranus plays right into this, is learning to revalue our immediate community around us, whether it be our astral community, mm. our neighborhood, our co-op mm. farmer's market, whatever, instead of relying on the big global stuff to do it mm -hmm. for us. This is a reintegration of the community as the centerpiece of life. I mean, you go to all of these ancient cultures and even some of the other current cultures, the center 
heart of life is the community, not my house, mm. your house, Joan's house, Jeff's house. It's the mm. heart, the square of the plaza, mm. the, the bonfire of the village, whatever it happens to be. I think that's part of what's going to drive some of this. We value what we value within our community collectively. Definitely. I mean, that's going to have to happen because right now we're all so reliant on big business and it just keeps growing and growing. And then there's the gap between like the extreme wealth, wealthy and, and the poor, you know, that that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And when we're losing our ability to commune and connect to the land, because I do believe that connecting to your local community also is like, where's our water source? Who's growing the food? Like right. who's making the clothes? Like we're really, and this ties back mm -hmm. into even like the stewards, you know, the original stewards of this land, there was a connection to nature. You knew yeah. that like you could actually go uh, talk to your ancestors through the trees. You need mm -hmm. the water. You need clean, we need clean water, period. We need clean air. There are certain things we have to have in order to just live. And, and I feel like those I'm watching change in front of us. Like who drinks tap water? I don't, you know, and like there's chemicals and everything. Those are just real things that we have to wake up to that. There's a lot of poisons going on. It's not about scaring us. Like you have to have harsh realizations in order to make real and lasting change. Cause if you're like, no, it's not happening. If you're in denial, nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna change. You know, if you've got like an abuser in your family and everyone denies it, the abuser doesn't go away. The abuser teaches the these kids and the kids become the abuser and so on and so forth and so like we're in an abusive relationship with big business and you know the ones at the very tip top of the pyramid and so that has to change and you know I think Aldebaran is an awesome star to yeah. be used for this I'm so glad it's aligning with Uranus because like having that re rebel energy of Uranus to say like fuck you like we're going we're doing what we need to do we're like here and we're not scared and we have integrity like that's kind of you can't that's unbreakable you know and so i, I think that that's going to be really important yeah uh, i agree for oh no nope. river uh, no <laughs> okay so <laughs> i just i just wanted to add for anyone um, not aware of the star aldebaran it's one of four royal stars they're named royal stars of persia um they are thought to be like the, the four guardians of the directions. These very, um, they're, they're each associated with an archangel. For Aldebaran, it's Archangel Michael, Michael, I've heard some say. Um, but these are, you know, the, 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 the guardians of the directions, the guardian of East. Um, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so power and wealth. Aldebaran is also called the wealth star in Taurus. Like we were talking about the ways our financial systems inevitably are going to be innovative, changed, uh, revolutionized in, in different ways. And I do think Aldebaran also can represent just great power in a similar way as we've been talking about Pluto. But these are like the throne stars and, you know, how is that power of being abused? How is it not in integrity? How are these financial systems, like finding the ones that do hold that, um, you know, the, the is true to that in, an integrous means rather than a, a corrupted power. Like these subjects are going to be very much a part of this in my opinion and, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree. And just the story of the royal stars, it, it, it there's a story associated with each one and that they're, and to abuse, you know, not to abuse your power by not being in one's integrity. The story of the stars is there will be a total downfall from grace. Um, so if, if these stories that have, we've carried through many years leading up to this point hold weight, that, that gives me hope. Yeah, you will you will fall from the throne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it and again, I want I want to kind of leap in here and and be like, I know that a lot of people have also said, oh yeah, you know, everything is going to be upheaved and it's going to be terrible and it's going to be there's going to be everything from World War Three to a complete financial collapse to 
um, mm. you know, earthquakes and volcanoes and all of that. And, 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 and. Yes. Because I do think that with, with Uranus in Taurus on Aldebaran, earth shaking events are going to happen. But I, I think it's important that people remember that these are never the the stars are always the, they always have your back, right? It's not just wanton destruction, right? And and the level of suffering can also be commensurate to the level of resistance. So mm-hmm. Uranus always, always, always insists that we just go with it, right? Stuff is changing, and you better just go with it because Uranus doesn't care if you're going with it or not. Like you say, your Uranus is going to is is a rebel, and it kind of, you know, doesn't care who it kills along the way. And neither does Pluto. Pluto oh, is yeah. also, you know, transformation that is unavoidable. You can't bargain with it. You can't can't avoid it. And so, when these two planets are having a return, the best thing you that we can do is be as open and aware of what is going on. Because if we're like, no, 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 climate change, no, nothing's, everything's fine. My climate's not changing. Well, and, and you know, it's interesting because, it, again, it goes right, I, I'm harping on good old Uranus and Taurus here as, as far as the community thing. And this goes back to the, the Debbie Downer, Pollyanna, which side do we play? But it, I just had this image of, so like Florida going through this whole business with another hurricane. Okay, you know the hurricane's coming. You've got you've got the roadmap, which is right on our screen right now. What can we do to prepare to understand what this hurricane is going to bring us and at the same time engender ourselves to our community to do it together? We may have the roof blow off. But if I know it's going to hit my roof, I might go hang out with Maria and say, hey, I got no roof anymore. You got a roof? You got a roof? I got water. You right. know, and it's just, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to use a metaphor along those lines for us to understand, as as all of us have said, it's coming. There's no question that it's coming. It's how do we prepare in a way that we can weather the storm, make the metamorphosis. You got to burn down the forest for the new growth. You just got to. It's coming. But yet we can continue to engender ourselves to our community. I see the barter system coming back, going back to Uranus and Taurus. Well, I yeah. See them, yeah. And, and maybe, yeah, you know, maybe because Uranus is involved, which does have that Aquarius collective energy from it. Maybe it's just like, how do we prepare for it? All right. Maybe the isolationist every man for himself way is not the best way. Right to to deal with these things or to prepare do you know the prepare in the term of prepper right i'm going to build a bunker and i'm going to hoard toilet paper and i'm going to do all of that stuff to make sure that i and only i survive it's shifting oh that's 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 there's so much there there's i want to i just want to jump and tag on to that for a second yeah because it it dovetails so much that we've talked about tonight into what Maria is pointing to there, which is that, well, first of all, this portends crisis, this portends turbulence, this portends change and transformation, which are stressful processes. They don't happen easily. They don't happen nicely. The feelings are going to get hurt. So so that's one thing that is we can look at this and say, yeah, that looks that looks unruly. That looks kind of that looks kind of difficult. And so that's why we're here. We're looking at this to be for forewarned and to have a sort of maybe a better strategy, a roadmap heading forward. Crisis either brings people together in community or it tears them apart. It, it either builds them up or it, it tears them down. And. I think, you know, a best case scenario does look like uh, reconciling ourselves with our with our role to the world and owning it in the, in, in the light of integrity. And I think a worst case scenario looks like maybe the whole dollar just destabilizing and we get put on a Nomero or something similar to the euro, like a Canada, Mexico. The strength of that currency would at first be Canada's and Mexico's. We would be greatly diminished financially if that happened. But I do see it as a possibility because 
that Uranus, that Uranus on Aldebaran is is really looking out. Geez, I got so many windows open. <laughs> it's looking, it's looking out at the descendant. And this is how United States deals with others. This is how we deal with the world. Mars militaristically, Taurus, we deal financially. And Uranus on Aldebaran. What is Uranus on Aldebaran? It's freedom. It's freedom. Trust me, it's 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 liberation and it's freedom. Now, how that mixes with Mars and how we have presented it with or without integrity. Have have we offered genuine freedom when we go in and, you know, liberate these these, you know, questions uh, have been raised about uh, what sorts of things are done under the guise and, 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 and in the language of, of freedom. And I'll just leave that there. Uranus return is this, all of these karmas are coming, coming back to like, th this is Aldebaran. He's going to, he's, we're going to be held. We United States citizens and every, and the, and in the world, as far as it's attached to it, are going to be held sort of to that karmic flame of Aldebaran. And that's why I see this as particularly worrisome. And that's why I do see, I don't see world war three in all this and i could be wrong i've i've been wrong don't i mean geez don't make your life plans based on what i think but i <laughs> i do as a spectrum i see i see incredible opportunity for personal involvement but on but on a but on a collective level i i see this could go this could really go sideways i want to i want to acknowledge what you're saying julie this has the potential to get really sideways so we need to be connected to our communities I absolutely agree a hundred percent. Get connected with your neighbors, your local, your family, just your your people. I mean, I could I could probably talk for another five minutes about Charles Darwin and evolution and 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 survival of the fittest. He never said that. It doesn't appear in Origin of the Species until a, a fifth version. It was an economist that coined the phrase. Charles Darwin talked about cooperation, ability to compromise, to to work with your group, to 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 submit to the to the larger picture as an individual. These were the markers of evolutionary success. The 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 John Wayne, I'll shoot you. You're in my way. The New York City, get the fuck off my sidewalk. That's never been a viable strategy. No. And that's what we need to look at in us. How if you I don't care if you live abroad, United States culture has infected for better or worse, infected this planet, has insidiously creeped into every other culture. That's MTV old news, but 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 we all need to look at how we've held that and and what freedom really is to us. And if we're honoring real freedom or if it's lip service and there's something else under it. And that I think is all I want to say. Thank you all for letting me get that up. <laughs> well, Michael, I, Michael, I'd like to say with that too, it's like if if the Uranian piece is like community and we are all coming together for something greater, well, what is the greater and who gets to choose the greater? Is it for the greater good? Or this goes back to the integrity of like, who's in power like is it actually good for us or is it still just benefiting like the top of the pyramid you know if we go through pluto return that creates divide we're already seeing the divide happening i'm not i think it'll be good bad and everything in between you know that's right. just kind of how mm -hmm. things go right. but like pluto will create a divide you know we're already mm -hmm. experiencing the divide um right. and so who who is right and who is wrong who gets to choose what is for the greater good, you know, who gets to make those rules? Um, those are some questions I, I point out, you know, what I think is good for the greater good, my neighbor might think is actually the worst thing that we could do for the greater good. So where, you know, who gets to choose where we like, put our energy collectively? Well, that's the and, and then it goes into the ability to have the conversation to figure that out in a way that does benefit as opposed to Maria making the decision or Verone or Julie or whatever. And, you know, and that's all about Uranus being the authentic self, you know, right, dancing right. to your drum, be free to be you, not what somebody else tells you you have to be. And I, I think there's a huge, I think there's the potential for a huge shift 
for mm. us, and I always use this symphony metaphor, we all come into this world with tuned to a certain note. And we've been taught to play the note that somebody else tells us we should be playing. And we're in discordance. And then you can't have a harmonious symphony if everybody's playing what somebody else tells them they should be playing. So that goes to what you're asking, Bro. And I think the idea is if we all come to the table authentically as we are as an individual and value all of that in each other, value the garbage man as much as you value the CEO of a big Fortune 500 company. You know, I and I, again, I don't want to be trite to that, but this is how we're we're taught. We're taught to believe that this one has more value than this one. No, we all have the same value. We all need to sing the note we've been given for the symphony to 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 take place. And I think that's going to be part of our divide and come back. That's you know, the great potential that it could bring us back from the divide. That's that's, that's what I see as a best case. Absolutely, thank you. I'm not going to go off on another one, but thank you. <laughs> Well, I also want to point out here, guys, again, I'm going to be a little romantic about this, is that all of this that we're talking about, the the freedom, the realization of the individual, the valuing of um, integrity, is all endemic in the creation of the United States. I mean, these are returns, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is exactly what was present at the inception of this nation. So even though we've collectively taken it to some pretty dark places, we've also taken it to some pretty light places. So mm -hmm. these these mm -hmm. these concepts are still there and they're 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 part of what this country was created for and about to you know to brew and to experiment with. So again, I, I at the risk of getting romantic. Um, this, this country's a Gemini. I was going to say the Jupiter return is really going to play That's into right. that. I think it's That's going right. to allow That's us right. to see both yes. sides. Yes, yeah. Gemini. You know, oh. see all of the information for what it really is. And you yeah. know, we've got in that Jupiter return is going to be awfully close to the natal Venus too. Can we do this in a way where we are receptive and nurturing to one another? You know, and and Venus rules Taurus. Again, we're back to the value system, you know, on the individual level, but we have to value each individual as well. It it's starts crazy. at home, kids. It starts at home. Value yourselves and let other people follow your example. <laughs> well, look where our North Node is, Cancer. <laughs> oh yeah, let's get back, I'm sorry. No, where, I, is, I, where is our North Node? It's here in, in yeah. Yeah, the home. We are yeah, destined yeah. to create the home, you know? It's, it's yeah. foretold, but we have to look at what we've come from structurally, South Node, to understand how that home looks. You know, it's interesting. It's very interesting. And what, um, so, and, and Michael, you'll, you've got much broader uh, knowledge in this, but I've been exploring the whole concept of polarity points to Pluto and how that plays. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we, we have, we have some of that going on with Mercury and it's yeah. actually where our part of fortune is. Uh, when I say our, I'm just identifying with the United States as a citizen. So it's where United States part of fortune is. So when Julie's talking about polarity points, it's the idea that everything, well, first of all, the idea that the heavens are divided in a very sacred way in in oppositions, sets of oppositions that make a lot of sense. The stars on one side of us are in opposition energetically to the stars on the other side of us. And that means that Every planet has a polarity point representing what it needs. So, so we can look at Pluto here on Sag Cap Cusp and say that what it needs to evolve is actually that Cancerian, that late Gemini, early Cancer energy. And we can likewise look at any, any point and get a lot of information about the process it's trying to go through from the point opposite it. 
So our Mercury, the way we think and communicate, the way we move, the way, I mean, Mercury is so core, is, is right there. And our, and our very fortune, the fortune of our nation is, uh, is caught up in this, the realization, the actualization of, of, of Pluto, the, the soul level, the soul level mandates and dictates desires and drives that are really sort of steering this, this mm-hmm. lurching ship. So it's a very interesting question. I don't think I have answers, but I can shed that light on what you're saying, Julie. And it's and it and it brings a lot about the core, the conscious core of the experience, the collective experience, because because Mercury in a, in a national is the national conversation. It's the you know it's the national. It's it's like <laughs> it's it's just it's where it all happens in thought and speech, right? Well, and cancer, ancestral roots. Uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're back to what Verone was talking about too, you know, being on the bones of the ancestry, being, you know, and and South Node Capricorn bones. I mean, you know, how much more do we need to see that we have to make this transformation? We have to metamorphosize in order to survive in a better way that's greater for everybody. Mm, yeah so we have a question yeah, and, about the pluto angle the it's the polarity point it's the exact opposite point to pluto mm-hmm. yeah which it's not pictured in this chart but right beside the part of fortune almost at the exact same that the same uh degree only four arc minutes away <laughs> is the vertex of the united states mm. And I just wanted to bring that up because the vertex and anti-vertex is an axis. And on the other side of, of this axis is Pluto. So as we come to this right now, Pluto is transiting the, ver- the anti-vertex of the United States chart. Mm. And the vertex goes across to the part of fortune with Mer- Mercury. And mm. so what I'm saying in this is... Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The vertex and the anti-vertex, this axis, this is, the best way I can sum it up is turning point. Mm. Like the, the vertex shows up and the anti-vertex as, as a turning point, as, and it's a, it's a really powerful axis in astrology that I personally use. So I see this Pluto return as really activating that turning point of a nation. Yeah. Where okay, we're thank turning. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> where are no, we go turning, ahead, ahead, River? Just... <laughs> oh where man. Where we go? Where are we turning? <laughs> I want to well, say that is Pluto. The question. <laughs> right, isn't it? Pluto is a turning point. A progressed new moon is a turning point. Chiron, I want to say just my opinion on Chiron is this is a very small body. It's going to have an impact, but a Chiron return, if you look historically, they weren't all turning points. Some of them were intense times, but a Chiron return, I wouldn't call it necessarily just like a directional shift for a for a nation. At best case, I think it could be a powerful, powerful reckoning with uh, our wounds collectively, especially in light of Pluto and Jupiter. But Uranus return, also a major turning point. So the energy of this whole thing is in wrapping up, you know, if time is a spiral and sacred time is a spiral, this is about coming to coming, bringing things to a close and going off in a new, a new arc, a new trajectory. I think, I think we'll, we'll have to see some expression, some flavor of that. So the vertex, anti-vertex activated in that way is really fascinating. Thank you so much for bringing that out. You know, it's interesting when the major returns finish, in essence, except for the last little bit of the Chiron return, 2025 numerologically is a nine, which means the end of Mm. cycle. Mm. So, Mm. Mm. and and 2028 is a two coming together in partnership. And 2023 is a three, which is the creative trinity. So this is really interesting to look at the, the numerology just behind the years themselves. So. Yeah, I want to I want to totally shift lanes and just remind us that we've been on for about an hour and a half and we may want to shift to some questions at the end yeah. or maybe do a five minute like let's wrap it up or something like that. Yeah, we have no plan and we're 
Just uh, sort <laughs> of. Really, out as we we don't have a plan, do we? It, it is true. No, no, Are you going to talk? Except with the intent to, to pretty much be done at the top of the hour. So it'll. Can be I say one? Yeah. One Go thing ahead. about the Chiron return. Yeah. Um, and just before we move into questions, um, I just want to give some context. For one thing, for the last Chiron return, which was. I was just thinking about that. Which was mm -hmm. 1974, mm -hmm. 1975. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and a few big events to like, so that was the, the, the end of the Vietnam War, the fall of Saigon was, um, that was 1975, I believe. Um, mm. The Watergate whole dealio, that mm. was 74, 75. Um, yeah. There was also a, a major uh, revelation that the the CIA was was spying illegally spying on Americans. Just some like events that transpired. Um, mm. It was also, I think, Chiron brings in you know a very spiritual quality, like the New Age movement in the '70s really took form. As Chiron returned, um, perhaps in in response to some of these, some of these, you know, events. Um, Abuse is also. Power. And look at his squares. Oh, if you're looking at this chart, this I want to be really clear. This is the 2025 return. I just brought it up because we have a Chiron return. What Rivers talking about was a 1975 return. So we're not. We're not seeing, uh, if you were making reference to the chart that's on the screen, there's, the, I just want to be clear about that. But wouldn't that Chiron returns transit still be in square to our natal? Uh, I'm looking at how it's talking to the natal planets. Oh, yeah, that that's, I think the, 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 na the natal yeah. chart, natal Chiron is square Pluto, square yeah, Sun, square exactly. Mercury, square part of fortune. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. a lot of challenge in that. And I think that goes to what you're saying, River. Uh, totally, totally. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, Chiron was discovered shortly after it returned. Um, Chiron was discovered by an American a couple of years later as Chiron made it to Aries. An American mm. discovered, astronomer discovered Chiron. Mm. But I also just wanted to, you know, this particular Chiron return um, involves Eris. So Eris, to me, that goddess of chaos and strife that she's named for, it is also about acknowledgement. So what needs what needs acknowledgement within our health systems? Chiron um, representing that as far as the mundane chart of the United States. When when Eris exactly conjoined Chiron, that was the onset of the pandemic. Um, in the U.S. chart when transiting Chiron, I mean, Eris reached Chiron. Um, and I just wanted to say we're going to have a total solar eclipse visible over the United States in April of 2024, while both the Pluto return and the Chiron return are simultaneously happening. We're going to have a, a total solar eclipse exactly conjunct Chiron and to a lesser degree only slightly lesser degree conjunct Eris. Mm -hmm. So what is being stirred up around health and healing in particular? And, you know, in, in our, we can talk about our personal, um, in, in a personal way, but this is, this is the country. Mm -hmm. This is the country. So I think the Chiron return from my perspective is going to be incredibly powerful as it's going to be coinciding with the Pluto return and a total solar eclipse exactly to the arc minute um, conjunct Chiron, if you cast, I use geocentric timing. Wow. So exact to the arc minute of Chiron over the United States and Eris. So I mean, Ri Eris River, the, the, the symbol, I mean, Chiron being the teacher of Asclepius, talking about health, that is the symbol that the United States uses for to understand like health, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the staff with the serpents going up. So I just, yeah, I don't see how it couldn't be connected to that right. as at least a part of an aspect of it. 
And I forgot about the total, total solar eclipse. And I think where that energy is going to be, have the potential to be hugely powerful is as soon as the sun is visible again, because mm -hmm. you're going to have everything hidden. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it all comes to light. And I think that's going to be potentially very powerful in terms of the, the energies. So, so how about if people have questions, either do the raise your hand or pop it in the chat first and we can unmute just because oh we don't gosh, want people to yeah, talk over each other. Yeah. Oh, and back to wait, sorry, back to what Maria said earlier. And I think one of the others of the group said the same thing too, you know, shameless plugs for the work we do. If any of you want to understand, how does this talk to my chart? I would think any one of us would be happy to have that conversation with you. And we can put our, our websites and information into the oh. uh, chat. So we have a question. Go for it. Uh, Kimberly would like to know, is there any way to boil this down to the political election process? Oh boy. Well, <laughs> the, the, the Pluto, the Pluto return uh, hits. Um, I'm trying to think of the precise timing of it. And I think that the third contact coincides with November. Um, and then uh, the Uranus return in 2028-29, the second Uranus contact in an election year. For those of you who aren't familiar with U.S. politics, 2024 and 2028 are presidential election years. So we have a Pluto return hitting on the third contact for that November, which is the month of the election. And we have Uranus hitting on the second contact, the big major thing. So to your question, can we can we simplify it in terms of or can we understand it in terms of elections? I think we're going to see polarization around uh uh, election and and politics taken to it to to a great extreme and I think that's going to be part of of what's going to make this difficult and I think that um we may see these extremes reflected in the candidates we, you can see the extremism of Pluto reflected in in the candidates um it's hard to really simplify it and understand it simply in, in any way, I think we just talked for an hour and a half, and I don't think we really did much more than put a really nice scratch on the surface. But that's all that's all we were really trying to do, give people a, a basic map. I think it will confuse American politics. It will it will confuse and and polarize and and make very electric, very charged. I think you can count on that. I mean, my guides tell me over and over. Things are going to get so confusing. The only way place you're going to be able to turn is into your own soul. So you better get used to it now. You know, it's like, stop looking outside of yourself for the truth and the power. I think that when there are extremes, you, you can be confused on which way to look and which way to be guided. So I think all of those practices of like self-reflection, um, balancing your nervous system, having rest, staying hydrated, just basic tools to like, care for yourself will be gold going into these transits so that you're not swirled around into the chaos and like in the spin cycle of the washing machine. Um, yeah, I think like every day, every single day, be like, what can I do to care for myself? Because um, I think things can be quite confusing and polarizing and dividing. Yeah. And hey, we'll need to balance. We'll need to balance in the face of extremes. Yeah. I think the Chiron piece, the spiritualism, uh, especially in Pisces, but the Chiron return that we're all going through and and um, speaks to that a bit. And uh, yeah. the focus, you know, the the alleviation, the, the way through is is through the soul, through the spirit. Um, I think that will be a guiding force carrying us through. And I, I also want us to, br to bring us bring us back a little bit to the moment right that we're we're mm -hmm. having this conversation right now for a reason with the planets where they are is a reason and one of the great features of the configurations we've got right now is an opportunity to kind of transcend fear or step yeah. out of old fears 
And so when we talk about, you know, what's going to happen with the election, the better question might be, who do I want to vote for? Right. And that's it. And not not worrying about what somebody else is going to do, what's going to happen to this other person, what's going to happen. Just just bring it back and and be okay. look, my voice, my opinion has power. How do I want to apply that? And that we can get from the astrology of right now and take that forward is as the opening into everything that's going to happen. We're, we're getting the, the astrological help to, to get us into our power, as Verone said, right now. So keep that in mind when we're. And I think intuition plays into that too. Um, and we do have another question about the progressed moon. So we'll go back to that in a sec. But, you know, it's really funny. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of insight into how Julie handles some of this stuff. I, I'm sure we've all had the voter pamphlet, and I'm not going to get on the political soapbox, but if you get, a, you know, an office or a position that you're not familiar with the people at all, you're just not. Life happens. What I do is I use my intuitive guidance to make a decision if, A, it's in my best interest and the interest of those being served by this office to actually cast a vote. And then the second piece is, you know, if I'm going to cast a vote, who is the best and for the greatest good of the community this position serves? And I'll use my pendulum or I'll use kinetic uh, kinesiology, muscle testing. So this goes back to trusting your internal guidance to help you rather than go, well, this person chose this, this person chose that, this book says this, this website says that. Use your internal guidance to help you for that. Just a thought. <laughs> we have another question. And the other question is up oh, where I can't get it. Ugh. Can you talk about the progressed moon a bit more? Uh, I guess I guess we didn't we didn't say much about a progressed new moon, except that it lasts only 29 and a half years. So it's not it's not a, a not even uh it's it's like a it'd be like a saturn a saturn cycle and they're about as significant i'd say as a saturn return um but not not dealing with saturn things so a saturn return deals with karmic uh consequences responsibility uh stepping into our own authority a progressed new moon well, first of all, progressions have more to do with our internal response to things. So it's all just really more how we're feeling. And 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 I don't know if I could speak with any great authority about how a progressed new moon is going to affect a nation. We're looking at the chart of a nation. So so but the 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 way to conceptualize a progressed new moon is that a whole a whole 30 year cycle of experience and evolution has just concluded and if i if i could i'll pull i'll pull i'll share my screen this is going to be a little rough i didn't i don't have this up but i know that i do have it available a progressed new moon do we have no no and i did we'll, put find, the link we'll find it i did put the link to the two part series you and river did about that too so oh okay Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This progressed new moon is going to be uh, in uh, early, early Pisces. So in a way, we're going to be wrapping up uh, cycles that have a lot to do with power in society. And we're going to be, I would say, the very rough strokes that I would paint of, of this picture would be a shift towards real meaning what what is really deeply meaningful what's really spiritually meaningful what's what's ultimately important not just beyond uh, beyond power and social machinations and global politics what because a question of a uh, question of the universe a question of of our relationship to god or or how we conceive this this spirit this creator this goddess this force so I think that's the I think that's a shift, an inward shift that's going to be happening um, from because the last progressed new moon took place right on around Capricorn Aquarius cusp. And this one takes place in early Pisces. So, well, we could expect to see a shift in the energies uh, that's that's correlate that's correlate with that. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that help answer the question? And like I said, there's a two part video series that Michael and River did uh, that's on the YouTube. So you can check that out if you want a little bit more in. It's yeah. true. That was a great dialogue. We got, we got, yes, we got was. two, yeah, two, two parts uh, dialogue there on the, uh, on the progressed new moon. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot to say about it. And then of course we'll have a full moon in uh, Virgo mm -hmm. where our previous cycle, the full moon was in Leo. So um, that's, that's what we'll be building towards. Virgo topics of service and health and improvement. And notice notice yeah. where our natal Saturn is in Virgo, health structures. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, that new moon is actually opposite the U.S. Neptune in Virgo, which is oh. conjunct the mean, if you calculate the mean Black Moon Lilith, mm -hmm. it's Black Moon Lilith and Neptune. So the New moon of the United States will be opposite the natal position of Neptune and Black Moon Lilith, which I see as a pretty deceptive potential force. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, the new moon will be trying the U.S. sun. So I think it's like the Hall of Mirrors is is kind of what I what I see, but I do see a potential to like connect to the core essence of what of what the United States could can and could be that sun that core purpose there is a there is a pathway there but we're also you know facing we're literally facing this Neptune black moon Lilith um, you know I, something confusing. jumped into my Something jumped into my mind. I just want to say, and I'm sorry, Vern, for we just took off at the same time. Yeah. But I think for me, the Neptune opposite the progressed new moon, it it brings to mind that the founding, uh, the founding uh, fathers and mothers of this country, United States, uh, they had forsaken like old world, like church based like kingship and all all the old the the rulership it was very rebellious actually against the crown this act of, of 1776 and um i i think that the language they used when talking about god was not very christian it was very occult they talked about nature's god mm -hmm. nature's god i love that i love that more than maybe anything else about uh u.s history is they were they were about nature's god the, these people were a little bit more in touch with their animal side than i think we we give them credit for and i i want to say too that that neptune opposite a new moon in pisces it will give great sensitivity and a lot of ability to have insight into these things into these spiritual matters and again no matter what happens out there no matter what happens to united states these transits will reflect to a great extent and the opportunity for us to to go on an on an inward journey that reflects that. And Neptune ruling Pisces will just emphasize mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite I so. Mean, the... It could be tough to tough to ride that wave, but if you can get get up on it, I think it could be like really beautiful, really inspiring, really spiritually like cleansing and liberating, right? Yeah, I think the 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 progress moon with Pisces opposite Neptune could potentially be super confusing if you've ever had a Neptune transit. You could be like, mm. "What is the Neptune tra?" I mean, I'm in my Neptune square, and I'm like, "What is the Neptune square?" You know, it could be really confusing. And with Lilith there, it could have some potential for um, manipulation. But also, like Michael's saying, Lilith is gonna tap you into nature the fact that we're animals too those like primal qualities the wildness so i think that if you're willing to go there inside of yourself you could unlock a lot of magical keys and codes that will allow you to kind of see through the cloud of illusion and delusion you know or being able to connect to that larger part of the understanding of the of the soul you know the 
And so, you know, I think, again, we're all going to do something different. I think that's something we have to realize too. Each one of us isn't going to be like, I'm going into my soul and I'm going to know everything. Some people literally don't want to know themselves. And we also have to know that that's, that's just how it's going to be. Not everybody is going to like dive into their own depths. Not everyone's going to do that. Not everyone's going to like go into their animal part. Like not everyone's going to find their primal power. Not everyone's going to do that. And so, you know, we're going to have like, an oscillation and like a different kind of wave or we'll do it at different times. So yeah, I think that that will be an interesting addition to the everything else happening. <laughs> and I was just thinking about the Neptune return. When that happened, what did that look like? And what, when was that? So well, that's 180, it, what, 186, 184 years? 65. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> I think it's Obviously I have no idea. No, but that, but so let's see, yeah. we got to do some math here. I had just asked I, her a question like two weeks ago. Yeah, but, I believe it, it was during World War II. Yeah. Um, Pearl Harbor, the bombing of Pearl Harbor was near near this time. So um, yeah, that was the Neptune return. We're at Neptune so at the, oppos opposition. 1941, yeah. Okay, so at that time we were we were near a Uranus return and a Neptune return. And and that yeah. that's that's interesting to understand because if we look at a Uranus return as correlate with World War II and we stop there, it's really easy to be like, oh, it's all circling the drain. But we don't have a Neptune return. We won't have the same sorts of, of energies. This there's no there's no reason to expect that that I that I can see. I just want to say that because I was the first one to to give voice to it. Well, but and I, remember that World War II was not our, we we entered it, but we didn't right. begin it. And in fact, we were, our, our role in World War II was fairly, actually fairly helpful. Mm -hmm. In the yeah. history of yeah. Yeah. wars of the U.S., um, mm. we, we may have actually done some good in this one. So so that one is not so bad. And you know, as as the resident Neptune lover here, I'm just I'm just gonna chime in for my girl. Um Nep Neptune with Lilith to me, and since there it is in the US birth chart, right? If you've got like black moon Lilith conjunct Neptune, it really tells us that there are there's an ulterior motive behind the creation of the US that mm. I think that a moon opposition can maybe, I don't want to say shed light on, but give us a sense of, hmm. right? Like That's interesting. Know, That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, we, yeah, we get yeah, a sense yeah. that, you know, okay, freedom and justice for all, those are really great words, fellas. But in practice, what what did that mean? And how, where have we taken it now? And we hear things like, Okay, well, you know, you've got to, we've got to save our democracy. All right, what's behind that? And that's where Neptune can really help us is seeing what's behind stuff. Mm -hmm. Strong Neptune sees all sorts of possibilities, can see into the hidden. And people mm -hmm. don't give her enough credit for that. But there I go. I am just going to quote that out there. Well, ne Neptune Virgo and that timing also, I don't know why. Neptune but Virgo, like, yes. Well, the idea of the Nuremberg trials in terms of a historical event at about that time where we were involved, you know, to some degree, and it's talking about freedom of health. So just tucking that one out there for contemplation. Right. So, and that's come up quite a bit in the last couple of years. You so. know, I know that, I know that, a lot of people and probably several people watching this and who will watch this will notice that, well, you guys aren't making any hard predictions to which I think we all say, no, no, we're not. That's no. a horrible habit. Don't do it. Children don't, don't, do don't it. make predictions. That is, that's not the kind of astrology that we practice. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, I don't think any of us think that's what astrology is for. I hope not. In well, there's free will. I mean, we can sit here and say, yep, this is exactly what's going to happen. It's portended in the stars. But wait a minute. There's these things called human beings in the middle of all this. So, you know, you got to factor all of that in. And, and anybody who uses predictive astrology in a way that is harmful to people, I'm sorry, I'm going to put it out there. Shame on you. 
you know, you, you, that's not the, what, what this is about. You can talk about the expectations of the energies, the potentiality of the energies, what's happened in the past with these similar energies. How do you look yeah. at these things as an individual, but anybody who etches it in stone saying, by God, this is the way it's going to be. No, no. And even if something happens, we each are going to have our own experience yeah. of it. So like, you can't really even That's make a it. prediction because like I could be having a totally different experience than Maria could be having. And so like, what is, you know, and like prediction is it's just con controlling the future a little bit too much. I mean, I think the best thing you can do is like, know yourself, do like go for a walk, breathe with a tree, like take care of your body and nervous system, you know, like really let the transformation happen to transform into the most truest, most authentic version of who you are in a soul level. Honestly, I think that's because then if we're all doing that, the corrupt like power structures or the weird things going on or the abuses or the traumas, they don't really have anything to grasp onto because we have changed as people individually and then collectively, you know? And so, but that, you know, that's no simple feat sometimes to know yourself. <laughs> Well, and I, you know, Maria, living in Michigan, you'll understand this. Michigan is an area, I grew up there, and it's an area that has potentiality for tornadoes. And mm -hmm. when they talk about tornado watches, it's the conditions are ripe for. The yeah. conditions may. So it's like that hurricane analogy I gave earlier. These conditions are ripe for it, but it doesn't mean that the cyclone is going to form exactly as we think it might. It doesn't necessarily mean that the hurricane is going to stay a hurricane. It might be a tropical storm too. You know, there's just yeah. so much that plays into it. And we as humans have a lot to do with that. Like you said, Roy, each of us are going to experience this in a different way. Mm -hmm. And then how we respond plays into what goes on too. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. How can we be aware of our surroundings but not necessarily like feed the fire of doom and gloom every single day. How can you become aware of like the atrocities that you're like, I will not stand for this, but not give all of your attention away to like, you know, that everything's going to turn out this like certain way that could be completely catastrophic, you know, because our energy is kind of the most priceless thing on this planet. And there's a lot of things trying to grab our attention. So you know, don't, you don't necessarily have to be in denial or turn a blind eye to things happening. However, like, how can we like hold down peace? How can we hold down like relaxation? We still have to rest. We can't run ourselves to the ground. If we do that, there's going to be nothing left. So yeah, I think really caring for, for yourself on a daily level um, for yourself, for your community is going to be important because, you know, going through a storm is sometimes you know, that can be a lot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Compassion pace, and pace, passionate detachment. Yeah. Pace yourself for a marathon is the advice yeah. that I always give going into turbulence when you know there's turbulence and, and, and the response that people sort of naturally give a lot of the time is to try to sprint it out. But the whole in uh in sanskrit if you go back i mean before sanskrit if you go back to oral tradition in india because we can do that uh, they never had a dark ages the word for this world system the name for this place is jambudvipa it means endurance or perseverance they 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 named this world endurance because of the need to pace yourself for a marathon with all the crazy shit going on around here <laughs> literally so um i just want to remind everyone of that i always reflect on that advice when i'm entering a period of turbulence like slow down breathe listen listen inwardly listen to my body don't don't react but respond right and and acknowledge when you need that quiet time, that downtime, that restful time, and not buy into what does somebody else think because I need that time. We've been so programmed into, oh my God, I got to go to work on my deathbed. You know, no, if you need rest, rest. If you need to stay home, stay home. If you need to hold space for your partner, hold space for your partner. 
there's no shame in it. And we've got to, that's one of the big transformational health structural changes I want to see. Stop the guilt process if you have to take care of yourself. Just do it. Yeah, and if you're also, if you're like, if you're in the spiral and you're trying to sprint through the marathon, like Michael was saying, all you're going to do is add more wind to the turbine, which will make you spin out of control more. You know, if you're like having an anxiety attack and you try to ask more questions or figure something out, like you're just going to spin more and more and more and get that further away from the center versus like, okay, I'm spinning out of control and I don't know the answer. I need to slow down. I need to pace myself. I need to find the center of the wheel. So then I can look around, not try to like add more fuel to the fire. I think that's something a lot of us do. It's like, if we're freaking out, it's like we ask more questions. We like create more wind, we create more turbulence. And mm -hmm. that's really going to just confuse us more. And confusion mm -hmm. is, is the last thing any of us need. We don't need more confusion. Because we're going to be getting enough of it in the middle. Yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, and that's, that's exactly what we, we were hoping to do. And we as astrologers, you know, hope to do is to use the stars, not as a prognostication tool, right? You know, this is going to happen on that day, but there's, there are some alignments coming up that suggest turbulent times. There's turbulence ahead. Be aware and, you know, do what you need to do to prepare for that for yourself. But it surely helps you to understand, even in retrospect, what's going on. Like if you know that, oh, my God, I just had the nuts to stay possible. Oh, Mercury just went retrograde. Oh, well, that explains it. You know what I mean? So that's that's how on a practical everyday level, astrology like this can really help you it helps with your mental health it helps with your spiritual connection and that's really what we were trying to do not tell you what's going to happen but tell you that something is going to happen it's not going to be a particularly easy time it's going to be an unusually turbulent time right and if you have your seatbelt and your oxygen mask and the <laughs> magic of the stars and your community of people who can support you you can stop that turbine from spinning, the what ifs. And if you have a bathtub with some nice <laughs> salts and, music. you know, like right. some music, oh, that's what Drinking I need. Dirt. Put your feet on the ground, go breathe with a tree, get some sunlight, drink purified water, eat delicious food, like sing a song, look at, find, talk to the animals, like, yeah. You know, and the other interesting little tidbit, and I know we're getting to the top of the hour, is one of the antidotes to all of this craziness is to get back to our creative imagination. Oh, yeah. We have been so pushed away from our creative imagination. I challenge every one of you, when you feel that turbine spinning, go back to when you were a little kiddo and you just played creatively. No structure, no rules color outside the lines, whatever it is, even if you can't physically do it in that moment, just intuit it, bring it in, settle into it for two minutes. Pretend you're that five-year-old kid scribbling outside the lines and nobody gives a crap what that picture looks like, but man, you had fun doing it. Bring the creative imagination back in. Not chat GPT, not AI stuff, not autocomplete, not color by numbers on your phone, piece of paper, pen, dig in the dirt, whatever it happens to be, be that little kid. And if you didn't get to do that when you were a little kid, because some of do us it. didn't do it now, give yourself right. permission to just like, let yourself tap into like the part of you that, that feels like you judge it all the time. Give the part of yourself that you reject the most a place to play. And yeah, yeah and it yeah, doesn't yeah. matter what the outlook looks like. Who cares if it looks a hot mess? Yeah, but the silliest A lot thing. of us are going to have to learn tools, I think. A mm -hmm. lot of people are not just going to be able to use their tools, right? That would be mm -hmm. great if I could just, whoa, a couple of years, mm -hmm. we need to use our tools for five years. No, some people are going to have to expand their toolkits, learn new ways of coping on the fly. I think yeah. mm -hmm. that it's great to go into this understanding, especially that Chiron return, Julie, as a fifth house Pisces. Chiron, it is about play. Yeah. It's about it's about unstructured play. It's our weak spot. It's a, it's our sore thumb. We don't do it well. We're workaholic. We're a workaholic culture. 
Yep. And there's 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 caffeine for five days a week and beer for the weekends. And that that's how we live. It's insane. So we have to reclaim, you know, this Pluto word, our own, our own, we have to reclaim our own biorhythm, our own sense of, of connectivity to life, right? Pisces, the universe, the cosmos within all this. So well, guys, stakes are high. Let's, stakes are let's high. Let's wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> Wrap it up here, go through and say out loud how everybody can connect with you. Okay, Michael, go. Oh, um, well, I have a website, oneskyastro.com. That's O-N-E-S-K-Y-A-S-T-R-O.com. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much. Julie. Uh, I'm at yourbesthopeswc.com. And you can connect with me there for how to coach yourself through this process, how to use your stars in the process, whatever floats your boat. And I also do Reiki medicine too, so. Brown? Hi, um, you can find me on Instagram. I'm Starship Moonbeam, or you can go to my website. It's veroneoracleacupuncture.com. My focus is empowerment. I use a combination of Chinese medicine, 13 sign astrology and oracular insight. So find me if you want to be a badass. <laughs> <laughs> and River. Um, you can find me on Instagram, River of Stars Astrology. And my website is riverofstarsastrology.com. My biggest focus are the stars themselves. So you want to learn about the stars in your own chart that would be that's that those are my favorite readings to give as well as like investigative if you if you have something in your life that you uh, want more insight into past present or future give me a, something to investigate and and i'm your man nice <laughs> and maria and me. Okay. So I have a website under construction. Uh, look out for venus13.com. Otherwise, I like I say, I write a little daily astro blog that I put up on Cosmic Reflections on Facebook and Radical Astrology. And you can always reach us if you're on Radical Astrology through private message on yeah. uh, Messenger. That's also an option too. I mean, we're really everywhere. It's, yeah. it's you can't avoid us. We're always watching. No, yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Verone, do you want to close us out? Yes, please close. The oh, show. okay. I just want to thank everyone who watched in the moment or is watching in the future, and I thank all guides, guardians, wise ancestors, ascended masters, angels, and starry beings for being here today. And I thank all elements and directions all around for holding a safe container of protection, starting with center spirit, north earth, west water, south fire, and east air. And the circle is open, but all of our hearts remain connected. And blessings to everybody. Love to everybody. Thank you for watching and listening to us talk. And uh, see you next time. <laughs>